Hello, everybody. Uh, great to see everyone. Um, my name is Jillian Hadfield. I am a director and, uh, of, and chair at the schwartz Treisman Institute for Technology and Society, and I'm also a professor of law and strategic management at the University of Toronto, uh, CFRE I chair at the Vector Institute, and a senior policy advisor at OpenAI. Um, as always, we will begin today with um, a land acknowledgement to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates, which for thousands of years has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit. These and other indigenous peoples across Turtle Island developed complex and effective governance systems based on respect for all life and the intelligence of the natural world. And today this land is still home to many indigenous people who are working to reclaim their rights to self-determination and self-governance. And we are grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on this land. And I know many people will be joining from different places today and we encourage you also to reflect on the history and relations of the land uh, that you live and work on. A couple of logistics before we get started, this rest session is being recorded. Uh, John will speak for 50 minutes and he'll take questions after his talk. Um, I will step aside and allow a faculty fellow at Schwartz Reisman uh, and my colleague at the law school, Anna Soon, to moderate the question and answer today. And during that question and answer period, we encourage all of our participants to use the raise hand function in the Zoom meeting uh, control um, to ask a question. And if you're comfortable coming off camera, uh, coming on camera uh, for questions, it's always a, a real pleasure for our speakers, I know, to see people at that point. So now let me um, turn to uh, introducing today's speaker, Jonathan Penny. Uh, John, Jonathan John um, is an associate professor at Osgoode Hall Law School. He's a longtime faculty associate at Harvard's Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society and a research fellow at the Citizen Lab here at the University of Toronto's Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. Uh, he's also a visiting scholar at Harvard's Institute for Rebooting Social Media, has spent time as a senior research fellow on the Technology and Social Change Project at the Harvard Kennedy School's Shorenstein uh, Center on Media Politics and Public Policy, and he's a research affiliate of Princeton Center for Information Technology Policy. Johnson's expertise lies at the intersection of law, technology, and human rights, and he aims to understand the legal and ethical implications of practices such as surveillance, privacy, cybersecurity, disinformation, online abuse, and a uh, topic for today, automated legal enforcement. Uh, his work aims to understand technology's role in censorship, surveillance, legal enforcement, and uh, online abuse and other public private sector legal and regulatory contexts, and in particular the impact on human rights. Johnson's work has received national and international attention and press coverage, including in the Washington Post, Reuters, International, New York Times, Newsweek, Time Magazine, NBC News, Forbes, Psychology Today, let's see, Le Monde, The Guardian, The Daily Mail, and many more on the international stage including coverage by Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Glenn Greenwald in The Intercept. So without further ado, um, uh, please welcome me in uh, welcoming, uh, join me in welcoming uh, Jonathan Penny to talk to us today about the chilling effects um, and the future, chilling effects and the future of automated legal enforcement. Over to you, Jonathan. Thanks so much. Let me first uh, share my screen. Great. And um, first, I wanted to say um, uh, very much just send a thank you to the uh, to the Institute for the invitation to talk today. And of course, Professor Hatfield for the um, the great introduction. It really is uh, an, an honor to be able to be a part of this very distinguished speaker series. Um, and I'm really excited to have a chance to talk to you all about some of the work that I'm doing and uh, looking to engage in our conversation later. So very much um, looking forward to it. Um, as Professor Hadfield said, that's right. My, my work is at the intersection of law, technology, and human rights. And um, I think the topic that I'm gonna be talking about today really goes to the, to the core of some of the questions that I'm probing in my research today. And it concerns chilling effects and the future um, of automated legal enforcing. And you know, just so we're all on the same page, 
Um, uh, you know, some of what I'm going to be talking about today previews some arguments that I'm making uh, in a forthcoming book with Cambridge University Press, which examines chilling effects as an emerging threat um, to democracy in our digital age today. Um, when I mention chilling effects, I thought I'd start off with just so everyone's on the same page about what what this notion of chilling effects means. So when I think about or speak about chilling effects, it's the idea that forms of government or corporate surveillance, um, regulation, forms of legal threats can have a chilling or deterrent effect on people's behavior. That is, in the face of these kinds of threats or concerns, someone would be chilled or deterred from speaking freely, from engaging freely, from acting as they would, but for these kinds of concerns or threats from government uh, or industry. So the chill is a kind of deterrent effect on speech and behavior and other normal activities that we engage in in a free democracy. Um, and I'm going to be speaking about these concerns about chilling effects in relation to automated legal enforcement both today and tomorrow. And again, since I'm starting with definitions to make sure everyone's on the same page, Here's a rough definition that I think is a good one from a work by uh, scholars Lisa Shea and Woody Hartzog who define unadmitted legal enforcement this way. That is a computer-based system that uses input from unattended sensors to algorithmically determine that a crime or legal violation has been or is about to be committed and then take some responsive action, such as to warn the subject, or to inform the appropriate law enforcement agency or take some other kind of legal action. That's the definition of an automated legal enforcement system that I'm gonna be talking about today. And I'm gonna be speaking about how as these kinds of systems, that the core of my argument is that as these systems um, become more sophisticated, it's going to raise really significant society-wide forms of chilling effect concerns. And in fact, just so, Again, you know, people understand the premise of the argument. I decided last night to ask ChatGPT if it agrees that chilling effects might be a concern when it comes to automated legal enforcement. And in fact, ChatGPT agrees with me. In fact, it, it even offered a definition of chilling effects and said automated enforcement, especially when it is based on algorithms that are not transparent or open to review, can increase uncertainty and unpredictability, causing individuals to err on the side of caution and limit their expression. So there you have it, OpenAI's very powerful chat GPT powered by neural networks agrees with the core premise of my argument. No, this is not a drop microphone moment and you know I turn off my screen and end and, and screen. Um, but what I'll actually argue is there's elements of what ChatGP talks about that it actually gets wrong about chilling effects and their scale and scope and understanding that in relation to automated enforcement. So the roadmap of my presentation where I'll be taking you all is I'm gonna start with this concept of chilling effects and advance a new theory and understanding. Um, uh, and once we have that new understanding of this social and legal phenomena of chilling effects, I'll speak about the implications of that new understanding for automated legal enforcement today and both in the mid future and the sort of longer term future. And I'll finish with um, some recommendations or thoughts on how do we respond to the threat that I define. So let's start with understanding chilling effects. And maybe before getting into the concept and some of the background, it makes sense to speak a few mo uh, moments about why it matters to understand chilling effects. As many on this Zoom, those who are tuning in know, we live in an era of increasing data collection, data analytics, and surveillance. And that is increased concerns amongst scholars, lawyers, activists, public policy actors, politicians, and the general public concerns about chilling effects due to widespread forms of surveillance data collection and um, regulation online and off. And I think the response to the Snowden revelations in 2013 are a great example of that. But it's not just online forms of surveillance and data collection. It's, of course, ubiquitous computing, um, the smartphone in your pocket, 
collects data about everything we see and do today and itself is a form of surveillance device that people are increasingly concerned about. You combine that with forms of automated legal enforcement that are already being deployed today in our neighborhoods, along with concerns about more sophisticated forms of surveillance, like facial recognition technology. Um, combining that with more sophisticated forms of technology like machine learning and artificial intelligence. Add to that concerns about shady companies like Clearview AI, which is taking advantage of facial recognition technology and these kinds of um, sophisticated data analytics and partnering with government and other private sector actors, law enforcement um, and security agencies. It leads to sort of a, a um, clear recipe for concerns about um, broader chilling effects within society. And that can mean self-censorship for broader population, um, less protest, less concern, and more conformity. But just to keep in mind that conformity associated with chilling effects, conformity doesn't have to necessarily simply mean people all thinking and behaving and doing in more polite or restrained ways. We also know from social psychology that social conformity can mean more polarized or tribal behavior, even violent behavior, depending on what social group you associate with and the norms of that particular social group that you would be conforming to in the face of chilling effect concerns. So these are a few of the reasons why I think understanding chilling effects and other scholars and activists think understanding chilling effects matters today. In terms of the origins of the concept, it's a concept that took came to prominence in the post-war period, largely in the 1950s and 60s during the Red Scare of the McCarthy period, where the US Supreme Court fashioned the doctrine known that later became known as the chilling effects doctrine to deal with overreaching laws and overreaching forms of government surveillance during this period that aimed to chill and to persecute um, during this period those that were suspected to be communists or sympathizers with communism within the United States, well, within also Canada as well. And then in the 1960s, a lot of those same laws were then repurposed to persecute and to chill the civil rights movement during that same period. But after this, of course, this concept didn't just stay in American jurisprudential law. It spread to a range of different fields. It's also taken a strong foothold within Canadian law, just by example. So if today, if you do a search query on the Canley um, decision database, you're gonna get a return of almost 3000 cases that are dealing with this concept and mention this query of chilling effects. And that's in a wide variety of areas um, in which chilling effects is raised as a legal and public policy concern. Notwithstanding this interest and this long-term sort of lineage that's entrenched now in American First Amendment law and has sort of traveled to other fields, including law and privacy and communications and, and what have you, there's been long-term skepticism about the concept. Here's uh, a line from Leslie Kendrick, who in 2013, after surveilling the literature, found that chilling effects claims had a flimsy empirical basis. Similarly, Professor Eric Posner at University of Chicago, following the Snowden revelations in a New York Times debate, he argued that if the chilling effect associated with, for example, NSA government surveillance existed, it likely would be transitory and of a short-term, even trivial impact. That kind of scholarly skepticism has translated into also skepticism amongst the judiciary, for example. So in the United States, in an early surveillance chilling effect case um, known as Laird and Tatum, the US Supreme Court dismissed a legal challenge to government surveillance, claiming that it was not a cognizable injury. More recently, uh, the Supreme Court reiterated that same skepticism um, finding that chilling effect claims were too speculative, that is, don't have enough evidentiary foundation to litigate as a constitutional matter. So notwithstanding that, since 2013 and some of this earlier jurisprudence, there's been a growing body of research 
I'm documenting chilling effects in a variety of contexts and in a variety of fields from law to communications, to privacy, to behavioral economics, um, to social psychology, for example. So the question now is not whether chilling effects really exist, but understanding the nature and scope. And there's still a lot we don't quite understand about this phenomenon, which my work is attempting to contribute to. Notwithstanding this work, skepticism persists. Why is that? Well, part of it is a challenge with predominant theories of chilling effects. That is, these are the way in which most legal scholars, but also most social scientists, as well as the general public and journalists and public policymakers think about and frame these kinds of concerns. The one predominant theory is that chilling effects are a product of a fear of a legal harm. That is, I'm aware of a legal threat. Um, that is, if I act in a certain way, I might um, uh, be persecuted or criminally prosecuted. And therefore, to avoid that harm and due to the uncertainty within the legal process, I decide to um, forego acting in a way in my behavior or speech is chilled. The other predominant theory is a theory of chilling effects associated with a kind of privacy harm. And that is more based on a kind of concern about reputation. That is, if somebody is collecting information about me, I'm chilled from behaving freely or acting and speaking freely out of the concern that at some risk in the future, someone might disclose embarrassing facts about me um, causing reputational harm. The challenge with these predominant theories, they're based on certain kinds of assumptions. The legal theory there about legal harm is based on a kind of deterrence theory. And for those who are familiar with the literature on deterrence, you'll also know that this is a body, the deterrence theory requires certain conditions to be met in order for deterrence theory to hold. That is in order for a law to deter. And those conditions are not often present in real world concrete context. The challenge with the privacy theory so there's a lot of context where you might have chilling effects or where people raise concerns about chilling effects where there's no risk of reputational harms, where there's no risk of information necessarily being leaked at a later stage. And so really the problem with these, these conventional and predominant theories, they have little explanatory power. And I've actually demonstrated with some of the work, previous work that I've done on chilling effects in relation to a typical kind of chilling effect that is a concern about the chill of surveillance within society. Let me tell you about one bit of research that I previously did. So following the Snowden revelations, what I wanted to test was whether revelations about the Snowden um, insights about government surveillance, I hypothesized that perhaps those revelations, that people being aware as of June 2013, that government might be conducting large-scale mass online surveillance, that be less willing to view or access privacy-sensitive content on Wikipedia. So how I tested that phenomena, which was a study that actually got uh, a lot of interest both in the United States and international, I think part of the reason why the study got a lot of interest and coverage was because of how popular Wikipedia is and the fact that it's simply like an online dictionary. There's nothing illegal or overly um, concerning that's on there. And nonetheless, I did find a chilling effect. Here's what my findings were. So the way I tested the hypothesis was this. What you see on the screen was one of sort of the key visualizations of the chilling effect. On the bottom is you have the 32 months um, within the study where I collected data over those 32 months. And I examined traffic to what I defined as privacy sensitive Wikipedia articles, both before and after June 2013. So on the left side, you see these are the number combined views for the Wikipedia articles um, running over each month, going all the way to August 2014, starting in August 2011. So what you see visualized in this graph is that before June 2013, when the Snowden revelations were publicized, both in the United States and around the world, every single month, 
you have more and more views of these articles. And just to give you an example of what these privacy sensitive articles were, there were those that I that you might define as associated with terrorism as a national security matter. That is an article on Wikipedia about Al Qaeda, about ammonium nitrate, for example. So articles that are associated with privacy sensitive content that if you knew that the government might be monitoring what you were doing, you might have concerns about accessing that content. Um, and that would make sense once you knew about that possibility following the Snowden revelations. What I found was that over June 2013 was a 27% statistically significant drop off in article views for those privacy sensitive articles. Not just that, I found in the months following June 2013, in month to month, statistically significant decrease in views all the way up to June to August 2014. So what this was a evidence of a chilling effect over June and the following months. Then I compared that with some comparator groups of articles. So infrastructure articles, for example, on Wikipedia, no impact from the Snowden revelations. Similarly, popular um, Wikipedia articles on topics and popular TV shows during these same months, also no impact from the Snowden revelations. My conclusion is that this was likely compelling evidence about the short-term chilling effects over June 2013, based on people's now awareness of government surveillance, and then um, a month-to-month -month longer term chilling effect. So the problem for the conventional theories is that they have very difficult um, uh, great difficulties explaining this surveillance chill. There was no evidence either before or after the Snowden revelations that anyone was being um, arrested or caught up in some kind of government dragnet for simply accessing um, uh, legal content on Wikipedia. So the legal theory of chilling effects really doesn't hold it, nor does the privacy harm theory really hold either. Again, there's no evidence following um, the surveillance revelations in June 2013, that there was any leakage or concerns about leakage harming reputations that would lead to this kind of chill. Instead, as I advance in my book, I think a better way of understanding chilling effects is using something that I call a social influence theory of chilling effects. What does that mean? That involves looking not just to law and to reputational threats, but also taking into account broader social factors, social chilling effect factors, which can lead to forms of social conformity that are akin to the chilling effects that lawyers talk about. And in other words, when you look to a broad um, variety of fields, in particular social psychology, um, communication scholarship, there's a large body of literature that documents forms of social chilling effects that are comparable to the legal chilling effects, to the privacy chilling effects that legal scholars talk about. And so when you look at some of that literature, they offer a better way of understanding the surveillance chill that I documented in the Wikipedia study. For those who might not be familiar, for example, there is a body of social psychology literature looking at something called the watching eye effect. And in these experiments, what social psychologists have found is that when people are engaged in certain activities and they are aware that they're being observed by a person, that leads to more socially conforming behavior and leads people to be less engaged in antisocial behavior. So they conform with typical social norms and are less likely to engage in antisocial behavior like lying or dishonesty in a game that they might be participating in the study. But not just that, what the researchers have found is that simply having artificial cues of surveillance, that is, when people are participating and they're aware not of an actual person watching, but simply the presence of a pair of eyes that remind people of the possibility of surveillance had a similar conforming or chilling effect on the participants in these experiments. And these are examples of some of these sets of eyes used in the watching eye studies. What this research and a variety of other bodies of social researcher from other fields 
presents is that there are social reasons also for chilling effects. And a way of better understanding this phenomena is to combine both the social factors, what I call social chilling effects, with both the legal threats and the privacy threats posed by government and industry to come with a better understanding of the scale and scope of chill. So if, for example, you take the typical chilling effects scenarios that lawyers and other activists and rights advocates typically raise, here are the typical kinds of scenarios where chilling effects concerns are often voiced. One, where you have uncertainty in regulation or law. That is, people are uncertain of what the law requires, and that can lead to chilling effects. Another typical scenario involves surveillance and data mining. This is something that privacy scholars, legal scholars, have been raising concerns about in relation to surveillance for decades, including um, concerns about surveillance studies, an entire field which focuses on the chill and impact of these kinds of activities and practices. Another typical scenario for chilling effects are forms of personal threat, um, in particular forms of abuse and threats of violence. One of my co-authors, Professor Daniel Citron, who I collaborate with, she's done incredibly important work uh, on documenting the corrosive and profound chilling effects of forms of online abuse, privacy inv invasions, and threats. So that's another um, salient example of a typical chilling effect scenario. And of course, the other typical scenario involves forms of power and authority. That is government conducting surveillance and data collection or posing legal threats or corporate power. Examples of large scale companies like social media platforms collecting data and potentially chilling that way. If you take these typical scenarios and you match them onto the typical factors associated in social theory with social conformity, they perfectly map. So according to social psychologists and according to bodies of communication scholarship, for example, you're gonna more often, people are far more vulnerable to social influence and conformity in context of uncertainty and ambiguity where they're unsure of how to act. We know from the watching eye effect and other bodies of this social psychological literature, often called the observational effect or the Hawthorne effect, that where people know when they're under surveillance or an observation, it can lead to greater um, social influence and conformity. We also know that there's literature that examines how personal threats, a lot of this is in evolutionary psychology, where a personal threat can lead to forms of social um, conformity. And lastly, of course, there's vast literature on obedience and conformity in the face of authority and power. So effectively, these social factors leading to conformity are kinds of chilling effect factors. And when you combine these factors with the threat of law and the threat of government and the threat of government and corporate surveillance, that gives you a better understanding of the concept of chilling effect in particular, its scope and scale in relation to certain kinds of challenges or threats in society today. So that's a new understanding of chilling effects that I advance in my book. What are the implications for this new understanding for automated legal enforcement, both today and tomorrow? So part of what when we look at the, the, the discourse today, often a lot of the discussion is centered on new forms of surveillance and related technology. So facial recognition technology um, has been the focus for a lot of concerns about chilling effects and threats to liberty and freedom in the West, in the United States and in Canada. And I think part of that, of course, is the involvement with companies like Clearview AI that are already taking advantage of this technology, as I mentioned, gathering data and gathering images about millions, tens of millions of people and feeding them into algorithms and developing more sophisticated forms of tracking and then sharing that technology with government and other businesses. I think also a part of the reason why this gets a lot of focus rather than 
forms of automated legal enforcement, by contrast, for example, is that we're sort of trained this way, something I call the Orwell effect, that through popular culture, certain representations of widespread societal surveillance and totalitarian dystopian futures, this is something that has captured the public imaginations. So when we hear about technologies like facial recognition technology, which can lead us towards this dystopian future. It's something that politicians and the general public really latch on to and are concerned about. And that's led to more recent movements, for example, to ban or prohibit the use of this technology um, in various jurisdictions. And that's been successful in a few jurisdictions in the United States. Now, maybe another factor in this is when you think about automated legal enforcement, the typical examples that we see around the city are pretty banal, right? But the reality here is in some circumstances, right? Um, and scholars and experts that study this, we're just around the corner from far more sophisticated forms of automated legal enforcement, which pose a far more risk of chilling effects um, of the kind that I've been talking about, right? So. Here is um, a, a line from Lisa Shea and Woody Hartzog, which warned that these newer, more sophisticated, automated legal enforcement systems will have a chilling effect on First Amendment speech rights, but not just speech. It will chill speech, association, thought, and belief. And of course, they're not the only ones who have raised these concerns. There are scholars from a wide variety of backgrounds um, and fields that have raised these kinds of concerns. So what does that future look like? What is it about automated legal enforcement today and tomorrow that raises these kinds of chilling effect concerns? And what are the implications? How do we combine that with our new understanding of chilling effects? Well, part of the future, and I know it's a fool's errand, to attempt to predict the future, especially when it comes to technology. But there's already debates within the literature around what automated legal enforcement looks like in the future. One vision of what that looks like, which is already to an extent with us, is a kind of you know, policing robot. And you know, Wired Magazine was writing about this all the way back in 2016. And 10 years on, we have new forms of policing robots that are already being deployed in neighborhoods. Some of the examples here, of course, you have Spot there, um, very well known as a kind of policing um, AI-powered robotic. Um, you have at the bottom a sort of more traditional kind of police robot used to deal with certain kinds of threats and bomb um, diffusion. Um, the robot you have seen at the bottom here, that's HP RoboCop, which is sort of a newer model that's just been deployed um, in neighborhoods in Southern California, which as you can see from the camera tech there, it's being heralded as something that's aiding in both um, um, crime detection and reporting. So it's again, in and of itself, an example of an automated legal enforcement system. But be that as it may, I actually think the future of automated legal enforcement is a little bit more banal. And I don't mean that in the sense that we ought not to be concerned with it, but it's something more along the lines of the micro directives that are predicted by professors Anthony Casey, a law professor at University of Chicago, and Professor Anthony Niblett here at U of T Faculty of Law. And in a paper they published in 2015, where they talk about the death of standards, they talk about likely the future of automated legal enforcement is a form of a kind of micro directive. What is that? What is a micro directive? So it's going to be something that you have automated censoring and surveillance that's able to detect a crime or a legal violation that's about to happen or has happened. That's combined with powerful AI and machine learning capabilities that's able to process um, that tracking and detection, interpret the law and apply it. But not just that, you combine those technologies with personalization such that a person who has is about to potentially commit a legal violation or has just committed a legal violation 
receive a personal micro directive, which gives them directives as to the law. That is, they're about to commit a legal violation or just committed a legal violation. So technologies that are already being used today, personalization, personalized law, machine learning, AI, surveillance, I think this is likely one vision of the future that's a little bit more likely. And I combine that with another development that I describe as the automated regulatory state. So what does the automated regulatory state look like? It combines these kinds of features in the future. So data-driven surveillance and detection, AI and automated decision-making, legal and regulatory personalization, something that Casey and Niblet, Professors Casey and Niblet talk about, direct to target enforcement, that is personalized legal enforcement where you receive the micro directive, you receive the personally received legal enforcement yourself. And also the automated regulatory state will be marked by increasing private sector partnerships and outsourcing. And while this notion of micro directives or future forms of automated legal enforcement at times might seem far-fetched, when you step back, a lot of these elements of the automated regulatory state are already emerging or being deployed. So we have automated legal enforcement in our communities and around us. There are new forms of automated surveillance and detect uh, detection, which are being combined with machine learning and AI. And China is one, just one jurisdiction that's experimenting with these kinds of technologies and increasing law enforcement in North America as well. And of course, we know data collection and monitoring is a concern um, as well. You combine that with large-scale government data analytics. And this is actually a slide um, from a slide deck that IBM execs are pitching to governments today so that governments can be more data-driven and be employing data analytics in their decision-making more commonly. And of course, um, in Canada, we already know, thanks to some great work from my colleagues at the Citizen Lab, as just one example, that automated decision making is already being employed by government. So in this report, Bots at the Gate, they document how automated decision making is being already used within the immigration and refugee system. And they talk about some of the concerns centered on that and includes concerns about self-censorship and chilling effects and concerns about fairness, by example. So when you combine all of this with the concerns about micro-directives and the automated regulatory state, when you think about all of these features and we move back to the what I define as the, the social influence theory of chilling effects, when we combine these two uh, understanding, we can see using this understanding of chilling effects, the threat that these new kinds of systems are likely to pose. So going back to what I defined or described as the chilling effect factors. So first, uncertainty and ambiguity, surveillance, right? Mere observation is evident in the watching eye effect. Concerns about personal threats and authority, that is expressions of power and how that can lead to chill and conformity. When you look to that definition of automated legal enforcement that Shea and Hartzog um, set out and that I shared at the very beginning of the presentation, you can see all of those chilling effect factors present. You see here reference to unattended sensors that algorithmically determine that a crime has been or about to be committed. So you've got pervasive automated surveillance. You've got the presence of power and authority in the sense that if the automated legal system is enforcing criminal law or enforcing legal interests, for example, of a commercial uh, enterprise that might be using an automated legal system in order to enforce their rights and interests, you have the presence of authority and power, either in big gov government or in big tech. You also had the presence of potentially personalization and personally received enforcement if micro directives and the automated regulatory state is the future of automated legal enforcement. And I think that's likely the case, especially with some of the patterns 
that we're already seeing. The other point that I want to make about these chilling effect factors is that they are compounding. That is, in the social research that documents some of these factors that go into social influence and conformity, the more of these factors that are present, the impact is compounding. That is, if you have one or two or all four of these factors present, the conforming or the chilling effect is greater. If you have more significant forms of each of these factors present, that also increases the scale and magnitude of the chilling effect. That is the nature of what the research on social influence and conformity has found. And likely that's also what I've seen in my own research on chilling effects. So such that in an experiment that I previously did, I documented something that I called the chilling effects curve. And what I did in this research is that I tested a range of different, what I deemed chilling effect scenarios, running from forms of corporate surveillance, government surveillance, all the way to a scenario where participants are faced with a kind of personal legal threat. They receive a personalized legal threat. And what I found in that study is that as you increase from scenarios that are more generalized, like general surveillance or data tracking, to more personalized examples of state or corporate activity, where you receive a personal legal threat from government or from a commercial enterprise, the chilling effect increases exponentially. And this is a representation of that relationship. What that means is that if I'm right about the future of automated legal enforcement and the chilling effects um, uh, curve, then these future forms that according to Shea and Herzog and other researchers, we're likely just around the corner from can lead to significant and profound forms of chilling effects that will impact on freedom and speech and engagement, and not just leading to self-censorship, but greater polarization and conformity in other ways as well. That's because if you look at those forms of future or near future forms of automated legal enforcement, they involve greater personalization both in terms of more tailored law, as Casey and Nibla predict with their micro directives, but also personally received, as I describe it, direct to target enforcement. That's another kind of personalization that leads to greater chilling effect. More large scale surveillance powered by data analytics that leads to greater chilling effects. And of course, new forms of power, big government, big tech, all of those factors are present in significant and powerful ways in, when we're talking about automated legal enforcement leading to great concerns, such that we may end up in a more difficult and problematic future that we wouldn't associate with a, dis, with a healthy democracy, but more akin to that imaginary dystopian future that Orwell wrote about so long ago. So, I know I've painted a bit of a grim picture about the future of some of these technologies. What do we do about it? And that's where I'll serve the balance of my time. Heard of the benefits of our new understanding of chilling effects is that now that we know what factors contribute to it in designing these kinds of systems, we can use these factors as predictors or ways of mitigating and reducing these kinds of chilling effects. There are, of course, benefits to these automated legal systems. They can reduce costs. They can increase conformity and compliance with certain key norms that better foster order and public safety within society, reducing forms of abuse. Uh, in other kinds of contexts. I know I've painted sort of a dark picture, but there are, of course, great benefits to these systems. So how do we mitigate and reduce some of these chilling effect concerns? Well, if you use each of those factors, it points of the path forward for what we can do with these systems. Use each of these chilling effect factors 
to mitigate each of these chilling effect concerns. So on the one count, where ambiguity and uncertainty that contributes to greater chilling effects, we need to mitigate or reduce uncertainty. That is, that's an informational challenge and a transparency challenge. Informational in the sense that we need to educate people, have people more aware of their rights and interests in a given context, such that and personally received automated legal directive or automated legal response doesn't lead to the same kind of chill. People are less uncertain about what they do and can't do in the eyes of the law. It also means reducing um, obfuscation, reducing the back black box problem, and leading to more transparency about the processes, about the algorithms themselves. Secondly, since surveillance leads to greater chill, we need to reduce and constrain chill. And that might mean taking a precautionary approach to regulation, as we've seen in relation to facial recognition technology. Maybe you need similar prescriptions on other kinds of technologies which contribute to these kinds of systems and other more generalized regulations. I mean, the problem with these kinds of FRT bans is that there's other technologies and techniques which can perform the same activities. Probably a better route is not banning technology outright and stifling innovation, is instead to provide regulation of these technologies and constrain surveillance in more sensitive contexts. I think personalization is an important feature which can, which can provide convenience. And certainly when it comes to enforcing legal rights, especially on the private law side, you can see real benefits to personalization of law. And there's whole bodies of legal scholarship heralding personalization of law as providing great efficiency and benefits in the future. But I think in light of my findings and our understanding of chilling effects, we have good reason to maybe limit legal personalization in certain kinds of contexts. If not in the civil law context, maybe in the criminal law context, where personalized legal directives in relation to the criminal law and the more hefty legal threats and harms associated with it can lead to greater chilling effects. And lastly, of course, we need to constrain power and authority, and that also will reduce and mitigate the chill of these systems. And that means greater accountability in relation to these systems. It means greater forms of oversight. And that means, yes, humans in the loop that you often seen, um, see, uh, you know, discussed in, um, in, you know, articles and presentations about AI, but I, I'm talking also oversight that's more democratic, more citizen-led, and also technology-led, and I'll talk about some of those um, ideas in a moment, but also concerns about fairness. So people's understanding and belief in the legitimacy of these systems, that they're fair and equal and transparent, will also, I think, reduce concerns about power and authority, which will contribute to chilling effects. Now, there are others, of course, that have proposed similar ideas in relation to these systems. But part of what I think of the insight from our new understanding of chilling effects is that these solutions are simply not enough. That is, if you look at some of these prescriptions, and I think all of these are necessary to address this concern, if we wanna have automated legal enforcement in the future, we need to be doing each of these things. But if you think about a social influence theory of chill and those chilling effect factors, as we employ some of these countervailing forces and constraints, in some ways, it might simply perpetuate the problem. If you impose regulations on different kinds of technology, if you impose new forms of accountability and transparency, you need more sophisticated government agency, you need bigger government, more sophisticated government, which of course can themselves lead to more uncertainty amongst the population, which can lead to other kinds of chilling effects as well. If you have powerful government oversight um, over agencies and over automated legal systems, you need sophisticated um, government agencies, which can just increase um, and contribute and compound the concern that we have at the outset. So part of this, I think, too, is that not just these are not enough, is that you need other solutions as well. And I think there's, in part, both you know, civil society and private sector technological solutions that can also contribute. And I'm not being a technological solutionist here. I think 
these kinds of solutions or ideas need to be combined with the regulatory solutions that I just mentioned. Um, and just to give you an example, I'm right now involved in a collaboration with researchers at Cornell University at the Citizens of Technology Lab, where we're studying, studying forms of automated legal enforcement today to come up with ways to mitigate the impact of these kinds of systems. Let me give you one example of our work. So for those who may not be familiar with, um, the DMCA stands for the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. It is a statute that when enacted in 1998, um, was enacted in order to enforce and police copyright online, to deal with copyright infringement on the internet and today on social media. Decades later, what the DMCA has now become is essentially the foremost automated statute in the world. That's because as part of the enforcement mechanism of the DMCA, you have something called a notice and takedown system. That is, if you're a copyright holder and you believe someone has, for example, posted content online that you think infringes your copyright interest, under the DMCA, you can send both to the poster who's posted that content, but also the platform that is hosting that allegedly infringing content, a DMCA removal notice. That is a notice that threatens essentially liability under the DMCA unless the host and the poster removes the content under the DMCA. So, so long as platforms take action when they re receive these kinds of notices, which essentially amount to a kind of personally received legal threat, based on copyright concerns, then there's um, a safe harbor from liability under the act. What's happened over time is that the DMCA, both its um, enforcement, that is copyright consortiums from different industries who have co large scale copyright interests have automated the enforcement of their rights under the DMCA. That is, they've used automated programs to detect copyright infringement online and send out these notices to platforms and users around the world, both in the US and abroad, at massive scale. Right? And in response, the platforms, especially major platforms, Google, Facebook, Twitter, and the like, who receive millions of these notices um, on a daily basis, have automated how they deal with them on the back end. And just to give you a sense of the scale, when the DMCA was first enacted in 19, you know, 1998, you know, just a little bit later, just beyond, um, not necessarily even a decade later, you had an exponential increase of these notices, going from a few hundred thousand to 24 million received by Google as of 2016. If you think that's a lot, so 24 million being sent in one year that Google receives of these DMCA notices. Today, here is a sense of the scale. So this is a transparency report by Google. It's received literally five, nearly 6 billion of these uh, copyright removal notices, including almost 4 million different domains, 300,000 different copyright owners have launched these and over 300,000 reporting organizations. So essentially you have tens of millions of these um, copyright removal notices being sent to people and platforms um, all around the world. And essentially what it is, is a kind of automated legal enforcement that is akin to the kinds of micro directives, their personally received legal threats that we envision being part of that automated legal enforcement of the future. So what we're essentially doing in our research is that we're first attempting to explore um, the impact of this kind of large scale automated legal enforcement of rights and norms. And we've actually documented that yes, for example, on Twitter, users that receive the MCA notices, this is sort of a, um, a, a visualization of chilling effects before and after of up to about 300,000 different Twitter users, we do see a chilling effect in the rate of tweets following receiving um, DMCA removal notice. But the next thing that we're doing in our research is that we're looking at forms of automated interventions that can reduce 
the negative effects, including the chilling effects of receiving a DMCA notice. Essentially, we're testing what we found, what I found in my prior research and what other researchers have found in their chilling effects work is that when users are more aware of their legal rights, that can have a significant impact on reducing chill. So in one of our experiments, we're testing whether an automated program which provides a user that's received, a user on Twitter, that's received a DMCA notice, whether receiving additional information about their legal rights can reduce the chill as compared to other users that don't have that same information. And the idea here is that you can use the same technologies that might automate legal enforcement for government or commercial interests. You can also have automated systems that can mitigate chilling effects um, by providing people with information about their rights um, to reduce those negative effects at scales that likely government working alone would not be able to succeed on. So maybe in the future with this kind of work, we may not have necessarily robots reading in law journals and providing legal advice, but maybe if you receive a legal directive about what you should and shouldn't do that's personally tailored to you, you'll also receive a micro legal rights directive providing you with some information about your rights in that context and where the, the requirements of the law and what might be open to you, such that with the recommendations around reducing privacy and regulation and oversight and accountability, combined with these kinds of solutions, we can avoid the telescreen and some of the dystopian concerns of widespread chilling effects and instead ensure that a future of automated legal enforcement is one that um, we uh, gain the benefits of this kind of technology and avoid the negative. Thank you, and I look forward to having a conversation with all of you. Okay, uh, thank you, John. Um, we're now going to move on to our discussion um, uh, period, and we uh, welcome questions from from the audience. Uh, then uh, we'll have one from Daniel. Hi, sorry, just took a sec to get my video going. I've got a weird shadow here. Um, thank you so much for the uh, great talk. It was super fascinating. And as someone who's, who is in the midst of a dissertation on the governance of police technology, it's given me plenty to think about. So I, I just have a, a handful of thoughts that I want to synthesize into like a, a pithy question so I don't take up so much time. Um, I, part of during your talk, I was thinking about um, you know, how a lot of technologies that are currently being used by law enforcement have a human intermediary. Um, so I was just wondering with respect to the chilling effect, where do you sort of see the, the human or the person on the other side, like on the enforcement side and all this and the, the agency or discretion that law enforcement practitioners have in engaging with those algorithmic determinations? Um, especially when it comes to, you know, their own decision making. And I guess the other thing that I was sort of thinking about when you mentioned the DMCA was uh, the idea of panoptic versus synoptic surveillance and the sort of the idea of, of citizens surveilling from or the, the few, the many watching the few. Um, and instances in which, you know, we've seen many videos of people take footage of police officers and then police officers start to take their phones out to play copyrighted music so that people can't post that online without getting hit with their own DMCA takedown, um, which again sort of speaks to this combo of like the role of the human in all of this. So I was just wondering if you could speak to that a little bit more. Absolutely. Thank you, Daniel. I think these are these are great um, questions that I think are, I mean go to the heart of, of some of the, the the policy prescriptions that I got to near the end uh, of my talk about what we what we really need to do in order to reap the benefits. If, if we're going to have a future of automated legal enforcement, um, what we need to do to have take the benefits of that and to avoid some of the negatives, um, uh, profound negatives when it comes to chilling effects. So on your first question, um, when it comes to human oversight. So for me, I think when you think through those chilling effect factors, right, and we're thinking about um, reducing the overall chill of these kinds of systems if they're proliferating, deployed more widely within society, which I predict we will see as technology um, uh, continues to you know, uh, become more sophisticated, is that to reduce those chill, 
in, a, in relation to those factors is that you need human oversight at a range of different points in the process. And you need transparency about that human oversight. And part of that is that informational point that I mentioned, reducing ambiguity and uncertainty. Um, so part of that equation, a part of that challenge is making sure people are more aware of their legal rights. And that's something that we're testing in our, in our um, experiments at Cornell. But I think the other part of it is understanding the systems themselves, having more information and more transparency about the system themselves. So I think, yes, there's an element of no, that where the general public would know or be aware that you have a human in the loop that is providing oversight for the direct operational deployment of the system. That is, when that system, even though it's deployed in the wild and it's carrying out its automated operations, there's an opportunity for, as that system is operational, you have a human that's overseeing and can intervene where necessary. That's one part of the human oversight. I think you also need oversight at later parts of the chain of the automated system. So when decision-making is made right, about automated responses, I think you need um, human review and oversight of some of that. right? Uh, of course, that might mean you slow down the system. It might mean that the automation or some of the efficiencies and cost savings you might get of the system like this might be reduced. But I think that is an easy thing to give up if you want to build public trust and reduce the chill of these systems being deployed in the wild. So I think you need human oversight at a range of different points. And that goes back to reducing ambiguity and uncertainty, increasing informational awareness of the general public, and increasing transparency, which is key to reducing these negative impacts. On your second question, I think it's also a great question. You're right, there's a dynamic here of panoptic versus synoptic kinds of surveillance. And this gets into, I think, some real nice insights of you know, David Lyon's work and David Lyon's work in, in surveillance studies. When we think about the role of technology um, and how it has both advantages and disadvantages with ubiqu ubiquitous computing. Um, part of surveillance culture that David Lyon talks about is this idea that it's not just now government or industry watching us, we're all watching each other. We participate in surveillance culture and we do that through our ubiquitous viewing device. And that can have benefits. It can mean greater accountability that we can um, record and provide transparency about government security and policing practices, which can lead to more accountability. But as you've seen, as you've mentioned, there's always a response for government and these agencies which have access to more resources, which have access to legal discretion to undercut those kinds of tech. So I think part of the solution here is not necessarily increasing forms of um, citizen surveillance, um, where we're surveilling each other. And maybe hopefully while we're surveilling each other, we're capturing also some automated um, surveillance as well to lead to more accountability. What we envision with our intervention that we're testing at Cornell is that you'd have these systems deployed, right? Um, both by civil society, both by agencies, arms length agency in government that provides accountability that reduces chill in a way that doesn't increase overall societal surveillance, where we're using cameras for accountability with these systems. Instead, we have information, we have interventions from automated processes that reduce it in a different way. Um, but it doesn't mean that these kinds of ubiquitous computing are gonna disappear tomorrow. You're absolutely right. That's a part of the challenge. Um, I think the aim here is if we're gonna make a response, we don't wanna increase the problem, we wanna mitigate and reduce it. Um, but thanks for your question. Thank you. Okay, we have uh, Jason up next. Hi, uh, yeah, great talk, totally fascinating. And as a uh, social psychologist, I appreciate your uh, invoking some of those uh, classic studies uh, on conformity. So one thing I'm trying to understand a little better is um, the data you showed in, in both your data and from that, that last slide you showed on this one, um, where in both cases, the chilling effect kind of keeps getting worse and worse over time. And 
I mean, I guess I wouldn't, why isn't it just a, a lower but flat line or a lower line that, you know, steadily creeps back up again? And we also know the basic psychological principles of like affective habituation, you know, what used to frighten you doesn't frighten you as much as you learn to live with it. Um, so, I mean, why do you think um, the effect keeps getting worse and worse over time? So that's, I think that's a, that's a great question. And, you know, part of when I, when I was designing the, the Wikipedia study, um, you know, using the same sort of thinking that, that you're offering, and you see this in the literature, you know, concerns of a normalization of surveillance, right? That it, as surveillance gets normalized, then the impact um, would be mitigated or reduced. It becomes sort of a flat line over time. And so what I had hypothesized is that I would see like a chill over June 2013, um, but I wasn't expecting that month to month drop. And I think part of what my research and other research finds to understand how and why you can have a longer term chilling effect is that I think part of that normalization process is not necessarily that people get used to the technology and sort of shrug and then behave as they normally would. I think what gets normalized is the more conforming and chilled behavior. So the normalization that you mentioned is happening. It's just that people are either, depending on the context, they're conforming with the social norm of their group and becoming more polarized, for example, or their constrained speech becomes the norm for them. They're less likely to speak out. They're more likely to avoid controversial subject matter. And, and it's done on a more subconscious level. And as a social psychologist, you know that some of those factors that I mentioned from the, from the psychology research, there's a lot of research suggesting a, uh, an evolutionary psychological basis for a lot of these factors. That the reason why you conform in the face of ambiguity, in the face of personal threats, in the face of observation is that you don't want to be caught breaching social norms, which could lead to marginalization, ostracization, which could impact on your fitness to survive over the long term. So part of the challenge with chilling effects is that um, sometimes you're conscious of the chill that you consciously avoid, but often it can be really subtle and that you just change your behavior in a subtle way and don't even notice. And that might seem to be a benign effect, but I think what the Wikipedia study shows is that over time and at scale, you can see the negative implications where people are avoiding reading about um, important public policy issues like national security issues relating to terrorism, which is an important question today, then and today that you might be avoiding and informing yourself on critical it matters of democratic deliberation. You can see that how that's corrosive over the long term. Kind of in a related vein, I'm wondering if, if also at least some of those people may just be not using Wikipedia, but they're still looking up how to make a bomb, but they're using more you know, encrypted or more secret or more dark web sort of <laughs> sources, it's something that's less traceable. So, on that count, there was a study that was done, you know, just around like around the same time. One of the studies that um, my Wikipedia study was based on was a MIT study in 2014, where the the researchers looked at Google search results and found a chilling effect on sort of privacy sensitive Google search terms before and after um, June 2013. After, thereafter, there was a researcher that posed the same question that you're posing and said, well, let's take a look. You know, is it just that users are not using Wikipedia? They're simply um, avoiding, or maybe they're not using Wikipedia, and but they're using a different kind of platform to gain their information. Um, and what this user found was that just after June 2013, there was an uptick in use of VPNs. And an uptick, I think, in Duck Duck Go. I think there's evidence of, but it was temporary. Uh -huh. um, and so I think part of that is you're going to get more sophisticated users that will take those privacy protective precautions. I think that's absolutely true. I think you're going to have some people that will avoid Wikipedia, but will still look for that information. But I would argue that's a kind of a chilling effect. 
And that's actually an argument that Wicked Media Foundation makes um, in litigation. So based, you know, one of the things that happened following my study is the Wicked Media Foundation, the ACLU, launched a lawsuit against the NSA and US government. That litigation is actually ongoing. And amongst their claims, they claim that NSA surveillance that was um, tracking Wikipedia was having a chilling effect, it was illegal, and my research formed the basis of the parts of their claims, and I actually filed an expert's report in that litigation. And part of their argument was is the fact that they're using, they're losing users and losing editors. And um, that wasn't a trend that they saw before the Snowden revelations. And so they used my research as part of that discussion. So um, there's a little bit of that, I think, with users, more sophisticated users that will be looking elsewhere. I would argue that's a kind of a chill. But I think for the vast majority of the population, I think they're just going to say, you know what? Now that I know that government might be looking over my shoulder, I'm probably going to avoid reading about, I don't need to read about Al-Qaeda and ammonium nitrate. Let me just avoid that, just out of the chance that I might get swept up in some mass government dragnet. And I think with automated legal enforcement, those kinds of chilling effect concerns are going to be magnified. Great. Thanks. Okay. Um, I think we might just have um, time for one more question. Uh, we have one from the chat from Mary. Uh, she says, in your Twitter research of users, is there some focus on racial demographics as Black users are often penalized and brigaded, targeted, not only on Twitter, but other online platforms for language use? Absolutely. And I'll be very quick, quick because I see Chris also has his hand up. So that's a great question, Mary. And in fact, yes. Yeah, so in part of research that I've done, I found, for example, in one study that there was a differential impact, absolutely, um, both with corporate and government surveillance, where women and young people in certain marginalized communities had a disproportionately impacted by chilling effects. I'm also currently doing research, um, some empirical studies in a slightly different context, but looking at privacy invasions with um, Daniel Citron, who I mentioned earlier is a MacArthur Fellow and a professor at U uh, UNC Virginia Law School, where we also see from forms of intimate privacy violation, the chilling effect is greater on marginalized groups as well. So you're absolutely right. We see that in our research. It's anecdotally found if you talk to activists in the fields, it's there. And I think that's an area where we need more research. But in some of the preliminary work that I've done and others have done, we do see those differential chilling effects. Okay, uh, Chris. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and this has been tremendously interesting and, and really relevant to me. Um, in that I'm doing some research on online abuse of, of journalists globally, as well as stuff I've done on politicians. And I just wanted to exactly follow up on that question about differential effects. And I'm wondering if your model can help us understand that. So you say you have a four-dimensional model of types of factors. So in, a, in say, your study finding women are more likely to um, be chilled in their contributions in, in an environment where they might be more likely to expect um, online harassment. Um, that's something I've seen in, in our research too. Um, and so I'm wondering, are there dimensions? So say uh, more um, concern or vul vulnerability to abuse versus the men to generalize being more affected by the surveillance dimension or something else. So differential effects. And then, and then related to that is, can we leverage that in a positive way thinking about the online environment, because we might wish you could chill lawful but awful or uncivil speech by some users or in some ways while ex in order to expand the speech of others. And I'm wondering, I think this kind of differential chilling effect is really important both for um, marginalized groups being further chilled and for more uh, hostile or aggressive actors in different spaces who, who could perhaps use a little chilling. So these are great questions that I know. So I know Chris, and I know Chris does fantastic work uh, on online abuse um, and disinformation. So it's great to have you, Chris. And I think your questions um, are right on point and excellent. So um, on, on your first question, and I, I do think that some of the, the chilling effect factors as I define them can help explain and understand some of those differential effects that you've mentioned. Part of how I and, and, and Danielle have hypothesized 
is the reason why, for example, that prior study that I found that women um, were more likely to be chilled in those studies. I attributed that both um, um, to the fact that women, and including with more marginalized communities, are more likely to have been victims of online abuse in the past or witnessed it amongst um, their friends, right? And that you could say that also with marginalized communities, more disproportionately the victims of these kinds of online abuse um, and are more likely to have experienced that and are more likely to have witnessed it within their communities amongst their social circles. And I think when you have that kind of understanding and experience, when you get into those factors, that is you have a past experience with a personal threat, be it abuse or be it a privacy invasion, that's going to make the chill and magnify the chill in the current context. I also think when you think about some of these other factors, um, uh, the surveillance factor and the power and the authority factor, I think necessarily there's a gendered component to power and authority. Um, when it comes to women and how they are, and there are evidence that women are treated differently by law enforcement. Law enforcement don't take these kinds of claims seriously. And that's been a huge problem for activists when it comes to online abuse, as you're aware, getting law enforcement to take that seriously and to take action is a huge problem. That's another awareness that women and, and marginalized communities are gonna be more aware of when they're facing these kinds of threats and chilling effects. Other thing about online abuse, when you receive an online threat, I think that also triggers the surveillance factor as well. That is, if you receive this kind of threat, you know you're being watched. So that's another factor at play there. Someone is watching you, someone's threatening you for something you've done in the past and what you might be doing in the future. So I think when you think about online abuse, especially when someone's personally targeted and you know, they've been doxxed or information has been leaked or they've been hacked and, and there are documented cases of this, as you know, you see all of those factors coming into play, which is why I think the chill in these contexts is pretty profound. Um, on your second point, I'll just very quickly mention some work that Danielle Citron and I are doing. We're exactly what you've mentioned, that certain laws, when they're properly tailored, that laws can actually also have a salutary effect when it comes to chill. That is, yes, laws can chill speech, that's the typical argument, but due to expressive law theory, laws are symbolic and they can also send messages that the participation in speech of certain groups, especially victims of online abuse, if their contributions are value and you put in place legal protections, what we find in our research, that that can have a salutary impact and encourage greater speech and engagement from these groups. So you have a salutary effect of law. And so we author a piece, Law, which frees us to speak, which we talk about some of that research, and we have more research that's coming, so um, keep an eye out. So thanks for your questions. Um, this has been great. Okay, uh, thank you so much, John, for your presentation. Really appreciate you taking the time to uh, speak with us. Uh, so everyone, please join us next week for a talk by Owen Evans, a research associate at Oxford University's Future of Humanity Institute, entitled Truthful Language Models and AI Alignment. And we look forward to seeing you all next week, next Wednesday at 3.10 p.m. All right, thank you.